Idoya. Um, hello, good afternoon, and uh, welcome everybody to the third and last talk around Preterito Perfecto, the exhibition curated by Bruno Leitao for Nieves Fernandez Gallery. We want first to thank again Bruno for his work with this exhibition, which we at the gallery have been very happy to have. And today we want to say hello and a very special thanks to Grada Quilomba. It's a real luxury to be able to have you here today. And it's been a privilege to have your wonderful work at the gallery these weeks. We have enjoyed every minute. And I can really say that as gallerists, one of the best things and most rewarding experiences we can have is to be able to exhibit work of an artist we have been long following. So thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I only would like to say finally that for those of you who have not been able to see the exhibition, um, at the web of the gallery, you will have a video with a visit to the exhibition um, with Bruno explaining the, the exhibition. And also that if any of you want to make a question, um, you can write it on the chat, which is only um, available for uh, Pedro, who is uh, controlling the, the, the talk, but he will translate the questions to Bruno or Grada. So thank you. Hello, Bruno. Hello, Idoya. Well, thank you so much, Idoya and um, Nerea and Pedro for receiving this exhibition. I think it's... Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with these amazing artists and to be uh, welcome in, in a, a place like NF Gallery uh, in this way. Um, the exhibition is coming to, to its uh, last week. And uh, we, today we are going to do the final talk with, um, with Grada Quilomba. And um, we have her here live. Uh, and this is going, I'm going to present Grada briefly. And then I'm going to talk to Grada and um, she, she's going to explain to us a little bit about the piece that, that, that we have in the exhibition. And also, uh, we're going to dig deep a little bit. Well, not too deep, but. Time allowing, we're going to ask you some questions about your practice as a researcher as well. Uh, and then we'll open the, the floor to questions such as, uh, like uh, Idoya said before. So, uh, Grada Quilomba is an interdis interdisciplinary artist and writer born and raised and living in Berlin. Her work draws on the repressed history of colonialism and its legacy on memory, trauma, race, gender, and knowledge production. Quilombo is best known for her subversive writing and her unconventional use of artistic practices, in which she gives body, voice, and image to her own text using a variety of formats, such as staged reading, performance, and video installation. In her work, Quilomba intentionally creates an hybrid space between the academic and the artistic languages and uses storytelling as the central element for the, co the colonial practices. Quilomba's work has been presented internationally, including Berlin Biennial Documenta, 14th, Biennial de, uh, Biennale de São Paulo, Roma Biennale Balticum, the Power Plant, Toronto, Matt, Galeria Avenida de India in Lisbon, WDW Center for Contemporary Art, Rotterdam, Secession Museum in Vienna, Gozar Museum in Brussels, Savi Contemporary in Berlin, Maxim Gorky Theater in Berlin, among others. Her written work has been published in num numerous international anthologies and it's translated into several languages. And she's going to be translated into Spanish as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm not sure if we can talk about it yet. Um, so, my dear Grada, uh, it's been a pleasure to have your wonderful piece, the last piece of a puzzle of three, uh, Antigona, pertaining to the series um, Illusions. And 
in the frame of the exhibition, uh, the exhibition uh, Preterito Perfecto, would the title would translate into past perfect mm. in a way. So uh, this was kind of, um, um, uh, I was playing with the, with the idea of the past and of the perfect past. So it's a joke on, on this, the time itself. Um, your piece is different from, from the other artists. Angela um, Ferreira deals with, with the idea of uh, homage, but also the, the possibility for empathy with people who are exiled for political reasons. Uh, Rogelio Lopez Cuenca is framing the exhibition in the Spanish state, taking all these questions into the Spanish history. Uh, and you drive from um, European myths to talk about the relations between Europe, or we can also expand this, the, the idea of uh, the confrontation of, or the relation between North Atlantic culture and the rest of the world. And it's, uh, uh, it's dominance and uh, it's uh, inabilities. So to start off uh, this session, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you to, to tell us about Antigona and then maybe frame it within the, the series itself so we can go from there. Yes. Of course. Um, well, I, I, I'm very happy to be here and I want to thank you all for having my work at the gallery and at this exhibition. And it's a pleasure always to work with you. And it's beautiful to have Antigona there. I remember when we started talking about um, our work for this exhibition, uh, it was, I think, at the beginning of the pa uh, pandemic. And um, there were a lot of um, different topics that were rising. Um, it was at the time where, when the Black Lives Matter were starting to become even more active. And I remember we were talking about how important it would be to show the very last piece, volume of the trilogy, Illusions, Antigona. And Antigona is a very special a uh, very special um, uh, myth um, because Antigona speaks about a woman who um, saw both brothers being killing each other. And one brother um, is identified as a, represent, a representation of the ideal of the nation. And therefore the king, Creon, says this brother of yours can be buried. The other brother who opposed the nation um, was not allowed to be buried. So he threats everyone who dares to challenge his rules and to challenge his decision and who wants to bury the second brother will face death. So the Antigona raises this very um, important question of um, to whom do we obey and which rules are these that we obey? And what Antigona did uh, was um, she questioned uh, uh, King Creon by saying, well, you are just, you are king, but you are just a man and every single man create their own rules. So I, as a woman, do not respect the laws of a man, but I respect the laws of humanity, the laws of the God. So she talks about, she brings a, 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 a bigger question to humanity. And she dares to bury her own brother and, um, and is then sentenced to death because of that. So this is a story that have been told many times. What I wanted to bring into this illusion series, this trilogy, 
was to place these very beautiful tragedies, uh, human tragedies, into the into the present days, into this post-colonial reality of ours, and to think how do I read, how do I read this um, this um, myth, myth anew? So for me, it is what I wanted to explore uh, was the idea of um, a burial and the importance of burying history and of burying, of having a proper place to bury our history and how this um, reality of ours um, is like a ghost that keeps repeating. We still, we keep having these kings, king creons in our society who keep assaulting and interrupting the reality with very uh, dehumanizing politics and, um, and how important it is to, to revise history and to put things in their place. So the idea of the burial was for me the central, um, the, the focus of this piece for me, uh, the importance of a burial. And then if I place it in the African diaspora, of course, I'm talking about the fact that we have a history that was not allowed to practice rituals, not allowed to practice ceremonies where you produce, of course, memory. Um, you need to do this performance and these rituals and these ceremonies in order to produce um, memory, in order to, um, to revise history, in order to have, uh, to bury, to have a dignifying burial to your history. And so this is how I transformed the history, the story of uh, Antigona into nowadays, into this um, urgency of to redefine history, to tell things and, you to, and to make a proper burial so that the ghosts of the past don't uh, assault us anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was the last, the last piece, which I think uh, of the trilogy, which really brings together uh, the three myths, and and um, and it's a very, uh, I think it's a, a feminist, the colonial feminist story. I, I like that. <laughs> yes, actually, there's this element of being the last piece where you can hear your voice in the end. It's kind of like wrapping up a little mm. bit, making the sense of the video very clear. Mm. Whereas in the other two volumes, uh, you had you had this more metaphorical approach. Mm. Uh, I find that, that very interesting, like not, not being afraid to, to tell things as you see them. Mm. I think... Uh you can go ahead sorry <laughs> <laughs> no i think i think it's interesting thinking of you as um coming from you've only become an artist recently i mean uh, in comparatively to your huge practice as a, as even as a writer and as a as a researcher so uh but maybe you could tell us just briefly about the two other uh, two other uh, parts of the illusions, um, just so that we can situate our audience in, in your in this kind of, in this all, this whole project. Well, uh, the trilogy, um, uh, I started the the first volume during the Biennale de São Paulo in two thousand sixteen, and I had this idea of. I wanted very much to work with mythology. I don't know if you're seeing me because I see myself in a very little corner on the top. Yeah, we're Can seeing you, see? you. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. You're spotlighted. <laughs> no, I, 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 I have many windows here. I was not sure, um, and and I, I'm. I, st I started with uh, with the volume one. Uh, exploring Narcissus. Uh, 
And this was a time I was at the Biennale de Sao Paulo and I had another piece installed there and the possibility, the desire project and the possibility of doing a second uh, work in, as a performance. And I was very busy about um, politics of representation mm -hmm. and misrepresentation and invisibility, especially during the time I was traveling between uh, these countries and um, and I wanted very much to bring the story of Narcissus, which is a story we all know, and really to put it into the, this light of uh, this post-colonial reality and how Narcissus comes so well to represent, metaphorically he becomes um, uh, he, 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 he represents so well um, this society that only looks at itself as the as the ideal body, as the as the perfect and ideal object of love and the measure of all things. Exactly, and this is what Narcissus is. Narcissus and Echo, and Narcissus uh, was punished by the gods because he was so in love with himself, and he rejected and mistreated everybody else who who, um, who c would come close to him. Uh, so the gods, um, the gods punished him, saying that he would fall in love by someone who could never love him back. So he fell in love. One day he looked at the water in a lake and he saw uh, the image of himself, not knowing it was him, and fell in love with this man and um, uh, not being loved back because it was himself. So he's trapped in this narcissism. So from this narcissism, I come to this white patriarchal society that always... Um, compulsively always reproduce its himself itself as the ideal object, uh, not acknowledging and acknowledging nobody else. And I started talking about uh, politics of um, misrepresentation and invisibility. And uh, what was really fun to do was to create images. And this is really something that I find fascinating to come from this very uh, tragic and very political uh, myths, and then to create sculptures and choreographies and images that really become strong metaphors to what the story is telling. And that was a lot of fun to, to that's what I like so much to do, to translate the text into image and to, into uh, movement. So, um, then back then I thought it would be very important. It was out of the blue. One I, I, uh, one morning I woke up and I thought, oh, okay, I know how I want to shoot this. I want to shoot this in a studio, um, in a white studio with these round uh, 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 walls, uh, yeah, like no square skate skateboarders skate and uh, and that create this idea this uh, illusion of uh, infinity of this white infinity so it was it creates then an image of these bodies moving in a, wi a white infinity which is kind of futuristic um, you cannot it's kind of timelessness, uh, it has this timelessness, you don't know. It's also the, the white cube. It's also the white cube being interrupted by mm -hmm. these actors, by these performers and, 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 and musicians and, and, um, and dancers who come and interrupt the space to tell the story anew. And this is exactly what I wanted to do, to create this white spaces, this white infinity being interrupted today um, and to question its neutrality as well. You know? And uh, maybe Pedro can show us uh, an image again of, of the installation. Um, what is very striking is this, uh, the idea of the, the white cube. There's this kind of whiteness uh, all around. And then you have this uh, TV on the side where you're mm -hmm. talking, yeah. where you're taking the place of the narrator. Exactly. Uh, which is very significant. 
and here even standing on a like a tennis uh, tennis uh, mm-hmm. um, jury uh, bench. Uh, so you're in, a, in an elevated position. And another one, you're surrounded by several microphones. Mm-hmm. So you have the voice. And of course, you mentioned the, the word griot. And mm. it was, um, it's immediate. The vision is immediate of somebody taking the, this white space and speaking uh, as a woman. Mm. And, and uh, so uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about this? Because when you're in front of, uh, when, when you're watching one of your uh, videos, your installations, there's this element of, uh, that it feels like you're watching a performance somehow. So it is a performance. It, yes, <laughs> more than a video. Your the space ah. gets um, gets sucked into it, mm. um, and there's this element. You're, and then the metaphor of the myth brings you to to the idea of a, also a theater and uh, mm. the place to telling stories, uh, European stories, foundational European myths, right? Mm. And then you subvert all of this. Mm. And you drive yes. from... Yes, I, you know, this. I wanted very much to use this uh, Creo. I'm, I'm very fascinated with this. Um, I wanted to explore um, this um, function of the Creo uh, and who is the Creo and is the storyteller. And then the storyteller and... and the, who, Someone is like a living archive. Someone, the griot comes is from the West Central Africa, and is someone very important who um, who carries um, who's an archive of history, who carries mm-hmm. songs and narratives, discourses, uh, remembers historical facts. And uses music and uses um, also plays music, so it comes and performs with a voice. And I love performing with a voice. I love um, this idea of enchanting the audience only with voice, with storytelling, and with instruments. And um, I find that very fascinating because the griot then is someone who tells a story that we seem to have forgotten or tells a story or fact that we seem to know, but then is able, it has this very critical voice that is able suddenly to, to, to put it upside down and to deliver a knowledge that has been hidden, but that was always there. So the, the griot awakes us, awakes us to reality or, or um, invite us to look at things a little bit deeper than we thought they were. And I think this is really fascinating. And we know the Creole nowadays uh, in rap, for instance, or in spoken word, and it was transported Mm -hmm. during the slave trade, this tradition to the other side of of the Atlantic. And we know it in the blues, when someone sits with a a guitar and starts telling a story and narrates what happened, narrates what is around and how the surroundings affects the person. We know it in spoken word, we know it in rap. These are all tradition, these are, comes from the traditional griot, this performance of the voice through the voice to narrate and to to dismantle uh, politics, to dismantle the reality. And I thought, I think a lot of people do not know. They think that rap is very cool and spoken words is, mm-hmm. is great, but they don't know how this tradition, how this performance, these are forms of performance and these are forms of knowledge production uh, Mm -hmm. that are not written, they are performed. And the West Central Africa, um, uh, uh, most of of history and knowledge is not written, but it's performed. And that's that's why it emerges in in music, for instance, and in performance and in the voice. And I find that absolutely fascinating. So I wanted to create to revise these stories in visually and then to sit aside as the storyteller. And 
I first, it's a very long process. I first start by um, writing the script. Um, I do a very long research and then I write a script and then I draw the storyboard uh, how, of images that I want to create. And once I have them, I go to the studio with uh, my ensemble of actors. I always work with the same actors. And then we create the images and film them. And then I come back home with, uh, with the images and I edit the film. Uh, I have like two computers, so I edit the film in one computer and I write the script and you on the other, so that the minutes I need to read in the writing are as much as the image and the image is as, is as long as the word, so that it comes something organic. So I really add it according to the images that I have and, and I write according to the images and I edit the images according to the text. It, it, it takes, a long time, maybe months to put it together, um, or weeks and months, and until I have the final film. When once I have the final film, I go back to the same studio and we project it just like in the installation. And I sit surrounded by microphones, very symbolic, as you said, as this woman who comes to voice, who comes to tell story. And I am reading as the, perform the performance is live, I'm reading as the story, as the images come. So I wanted to work with this imperfection that is the performance. And sometimes I'm too quick and I have to make up words. Sometimes I'm too slow. Um, sometimes I make mistakes. I'm reacting to the image in the moment. And this is being recorded and becomes the second channel of the installation. So this is the process of um, of occupying, of interrupting the white cube with new stories. Yeah, just uh, just a small note. I, I when I saw your work the first time, it was uh, uh, it was very impressive for me as for everybody. I think it's one of it's not very common that people enter, especially here in Spain. Sometimes people enter the exhibition, they don't know you, they don't know your work, but they enter the, um, the space where we are showing the installation and they, they sit there through the whole video. Mm -hmm. This is a lot of people, again, I think there's, there's uh, something about it that is very enticing. But uh, in the first time that I saw it, I thought that I couldn't help but think about moving to the Sosa Santos words about this idea that um, Europe is an abyssal culture. So mm. it negates everything that is not, that is oral, that is not written. Mm. And here we are, mm. uh, back to the griot and yeah. the wonderful story you told about the uh, rap and hip hop and all those manifestations. So it's just some, just something that I thought about. It's good that it's, um, it's uh, you can you cannot avoid it, and it's such an inversion of roles, and mm -hmm. it's uh, also the white the white space being occupied and uh, an European story being retold retold by black bodies. It's so it's uh, wonderful in that way. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. But I, I wanted, you also did the, the, the other way around. I mean, you've turned texts into performances. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you yes. want to tell us a little bit about well, that? Yes, also, um, I think I actually, my first language is always writing. Uh, I feel um, it's the first uh, language that I use when I start any project. Um, and before you said, oh, you don't come from the arts, you come from the literature and the academia. And so, and um, it's very funny because I needed much time to be able to answer this question. And, um, uh, and actually I look back and my work was always the same. I was, I think, 
the work is always very hybrid. The work that I always did was very hybrid. It's just I did it in different platforms. Um, I worked for many years in the academia. I worked for many years in the literature. I worked for many, I also in theater. And actually, maybe in the contemporary art is the only platform where I can plenty work without this hybridity being a problem mm -hmm. and so I really can expand myself um, in what I do so uh, that's why I, I decided to give up uh, all the other platforms uh, previous platforms and decided to work only in the contemporary art because I'm much much happier here <laughs> <laughs> with poetry <laughs> it, it's it, it's because everything is possible and um but actually this this writing and then to bringing the writing into performance is something that i have always done in in my career somehow and the first when the first one of the first works that you're talking about is um, uh, the desire project where I, I brought text into a video installation and that was for the Biennale of Sao Paulo mm -hmm. and um, and I did that for a very uh, concrete reason because Brazil invited me to come and I wanted to do a work that is dedicated to this trilogy uh, South America, Africa, and Europe, um, because coming from Europe, coming from Africa, going to Brazil, I thought it would be important to dedicate a work to this trilogy. And I was very busy uh, back then, and still with a woman who played a very important role uh, in Brazil, uh, Anastasia, and she was an enslaved African woman. We don't know really very clear, there's different narratives about her story, uh, that she was born in West Africa and brought to uh, Brazil um, by Europeans and enslaved, uh, other stories, she was born there. But what is uh, main, um, um, her focus is that uh, she was someone who had a very important voice and a very emancipatory voice. And uh, she was forced to use a mask to, to become silenced, to become speechless. And this use of the mask was a very common um, practice um, during the European uh, slavery to silence um, enslaved African people. Uh, so to implement a sense of speechlessness and of fear of speaking. And I thought it was quite amazing that this woman raises exactly the same questions that we still ask today about who can speak and who cannot and what can we speak about and what happens when we speak, what could be heard if we would speak, you know, all these questions. And this perverse of the of the mask this level of brutality how we create the humanizing politics that are so brutal um, um, I thought it's so perverse it has something so perverse that I wanted to play with this element of the perver of perverting the visual um, installation, what is expected from a video installation. So instead of expecting images, I created only texts that appear and uh, that uh, you only see texts appearing in the, in the image. And instead of working with the voice, I work with drumming. Um, Moses uh, did the drumming, the music for this video installation and uh, he performed the drumming a uh, calling and i wanted to to speak to work with um with uh, with music as a form of narrative and again because music has been so important in the performance of music in the uh, diaspora 
um, to enter and to occupy spaces. Music has something very magical and met yeah. metaphysical because music enters spaces. So even if the bodies are by law forbidden to be in certain spaces as apartheid and colonialism does not allow, black people use the music and the performance of music to enter these spaces. Because if people cannot enter this space where I'm here, if someone is outside and plays the music, even if I do not allow this person or these people to come inside the physical space, the music flies through time and space and I have to hear it. So the music has been a way in the African diaspora of occupying spaces of a narrative, it has been very political has been also a form of knowledge production. So I wanted to bring this together. Uh, so there's this, um, level, these elements in the installation that were previous to the illusions. Actually, I have a question here from the audience that's, that really, that relates directly to that. Yeah. Oh. I think you are answered already, but I'm going to say it anyway. Mm -hmm. Musicality is known to be a strong factor for the cultural resistance in the black movement, from samba to rap or candomblé and capoeira. How is your process of adding music to your works? And speci specifically in Antigone? Yes, you know, it's, it's quite beautiful. I just answered partly. Mm -hmm. But you know what I realized that uh, from one volume to the other, the first volume was dedicated to Narcissus and the politics of uh, misrepresentation. The second was for the Biennale of Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was Oedipus. dedicated to Oedipus and the politics of violence and the genocide and then Antigone. And from one volume to the next, I work with all volumes, all the music is composed by Mio Muyanga, um, who is also a very dear friend and a collaborator, and he's an opera composer from South Africa. And he composed the music for each one of the volumes. And, and I realized in each one, every new volume has less voice and more music. And, and more dance. So I really come to the elements that I most love because I used to dance in the past. So um, I come more to, to the elements that I really love to explore. So I speak less and less. I tell less and less and let the music become also this narrative voice. Um, so sometimes I disappear and is just playing the piano and the actors perform to this piano music and something is being told. Um, Neomo Yanga is someone, is an opera composer who have been writing or composing operas on resistance, uh, struggle, um, um, also genocide. So it, the, mu the works uh, come together very well. Um, so the music has this uh, power of also producing knowledge of having this um, political message. Um, and it be I realized it becomes stronger and stronger in each work um, because it's a very important, um, uh, I think it's a political act as well. It's really, it has something very, very strong. I, I always have this feeling that um, beauty in, in art, uh, whether through visual form uh, or sounds, is, is kind of like, like um, I don't want to use the word weapon, but it's, it's mm -hmm. a tool to get into the, your audience mm -hmm. and then to, to relay your, your ideas and the poetic space of uh, connecting uh, things that are analogies in the end. Um, I had two more questions. I'm going to read one of them from the audience, from Renata. How important is it the blackening of the classics at this moment of uh, hashtag Black, Black Lives Matter? 
how important is the sorry the, the blackening blackening of the classics, classics. at this moment of, of black lives, lives matter well it's always important but you know it's it's always important and maybe now um it's a moment where um it's maybe i think it was always important and always urgent but we are now in a point of um of an absolute change um and what i wanted to do with or what i do with most of of the works is actually to to work with something uh, one day i was in paris doing an exhibition um and someone talked to me asked me or told me that something very beautiful said your work is about the politics of the invisible uh and i i was thinking uh, the politics of the invisible. You do the politics of the invisible, and I liked that very much. Then we were talking, and I realized, yes, I think maybe this is what I intend to do in the work. Um, uh, and the question is, you uh, you bring the black characters to to the to the work. But it is also this politics of the invisible in the sense that I think we are a generation of artists who just want to tell the stories that I want, I do what I want and I, I tell what I want and I only do what is important for me. And I think, um, and I do the stories and I tell the stories as they are important to me. And I reduce to the maximum, uh, for instance, I work with very minimal uh, scenarios to reduce the maximum, the expectations, um, to reduce the maximum, um, the, the projections. You know, uh, I like this idea of having the minimum possible uh, in a very minimal scenarios where the actors become the most uh, valuable and the most important. So I reverse then the the roles. Uh, what is usually expected to be a white actress are black actresses. Um, in Antigona, I worked only with women actors. They are all theatre actors, um, quite known uh, theatre actors from, uh, from Germany, from different German theatres. And they play the role of King Creon, the role of Sam, Sam Ammon, the, uh, the role of uh, Theresias, the role of uh, all the male characters, because Antigona only has two female characters, being Antigona and his man, but they are all played by women, black women characters. And that is so fascinating is that you can tell the story and the story uh, the tragedy of the story is so involves the audience in such an emotional way that you go beyond and race that deliver that um, openly to the to, to the audience, and I find that is what is the politics of the invisible. I tell the story, I want to tell the story actors because I want to work with black actors and um, they are there but they don't have to justify presence they just tell the story as we please and I find that very important to have this liberty and I think this is also these, this aspect of the colonial art that I can produce the art that I want to without having to justify myself or justify why I do it. And I think more and more artists are exploring this freedom that they do not have to create something to represent someone or they have to justify why the presence of the actors or the presence of certain objects they um, reverse that, and I find that very, very important, especially during this time of the 
that the Black Lives Matter becomes so important because it is a call to humanity to say, I tell the stories that I want. I have to have the freedom to tell the stories as I please to tell. And I choose the actors and I choose the scenarios as it best tells the story. And, um, and this, this call for Black Lives Matter is a call for um, humanity, for being the human. And being human means being free. And this freedom is very important to be exercised in arts. Um, and after having this conversation, I understood what politics of the invisible could be and how important it is to be uh, invisible in that sense that um, you, uh, you, create a, you create something that goes beyond the expectations of the audience, of what the audience expects from you as a Black artist, as a Black female artist. Did I answer your question? Perfectly, uh -huh. perfectly. And I, I wanted to <laughs> also link up this with, uh, I mean, this, I read about this story that uh, your seminar at the, the Free University mm. had to be moved to one of the biggest lecture halls because so many people wanted to attend. This is in mm. Berlin, right? Yes, it's true. The same thing happened in Portugal when we launched your book at Angar many, many years, the Portuguese version, many, many years after being published in English. So it took a long time to get to get back to Portugal mm -hmm. and close the circle in a way. Um, this is the book, by the way, the Portuguese mm -hmm. version. Where you oh, that's see a beautiful image with the reflection. <laughs> <laughs> the point of this, this cover is that you see yourself re re reflected uh, and there's a wonderful phrase here that I want to read after. But um, in Angar, we had to keep uh, 60, 70 people outside and, and, and Angar is not small. Um, so how do you see this remarkable interest in the work uh, of an artist that deals directly with racism uh, in a time when it's so prevalent on a structural level? And why did you decide it to well, in a way, how do you see this? Uh, because in Lisbon, um, the audience, and I can, uh, I was there, so I can say mm -hmm. this. The audience was not, it was the art crowd, but it was also a kind of, uh, um, a, there were a lot of non-white and that was, uh, that was incredible because uh, Art in Portugal is still pretty much related to uh, to this idea. You, you don't see uh, non-whites a lot. So for us at Angar, of course, we we work a lot with with artists from all over. Even our structure, we're not all white. Of course, I am white. <laughs> but um, it was it was a very symbolic moment. But how was it in Berlin? And how, how do you see this interest? I mean, what? I'll, I'll do you explain this. Well, um, I'm not the right person to explain that, but uh, <laughs> I suppose they like me. No, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm joking. But it's also true. When I was uh, working in Berlin, I, I, I worked 15 years um, as a as a as a, a professor as a guest professor guest professor at uh, Humboldt University at Free University in different universities, and I really loved the students. So there was a very beautiful, strong, engaged connection of love. I really uh, love connecting with a younger generation, even though sometimes they were, I was very young and sometimes they were even older than me, but there was a, very, a commitment there that was very, very beautiful. Um, so this, this emotionality is definitely there. Um, but I think another aspect has not to do with me. It has to do uh, with 
the work with a topic that I think there's a, a new generation um, that needs desperately and wants desperately um, to change their vocabulary and their language. And they want to enter spaces where they can see themselves reflected and they, and they, ideals and they discourse are reflected and they want to gain a new vocabulary and as we all know um, institutions can be quite conservative and reproduce this conservative discourse and many spaces become of no interest so um, I think it has not does not have to do with me but with the work itself that touches uh, something that has been silent for so many years and centuries and that there's the, a new generation that does not believe in the discourse and language and vocabulary that has been given to them to approach this history and um, they want a new language and they then they see that language coming from these this kind of artistic words and there's so many artists so so many incredible artists doing an incredible work that really challenge um challenge these whole discourses and i think this is what it is about i think it's about as opening spaces and inviting a lot of and many different people and each one with the different artwork and with a different perspective mm -hmm. um, to offer a language to this uh, new generation and I, I, I think that is the secret um, to that I think I think this hybridity of the work is also very important and um, I am not interested on in being a filmmaker or a theater maker or choreographer or a writer or I'm not interested on obeying any discipline in particular or to represent one discipline I'm interested on in telling stories and uh, to tell stories they come in the most different formats and I think this the colonial feminism is that that you do not you are disobedient to disciplines um, I cannot I cannot tell stories in the same format in formats that have silenced me in formats that have placed me as the other in formats that have placed me outside humanity I don't have also the interest to do that. I think what is fascinating is to um, work in a kind of laboratory in an experimental way and see how do these stories want to be told and to explore new formats. So um, this hybridity of having an academic uh, perspective, uh, uh, text and uh, work with visuals and with installation and with music and with choreography and all these different aspects that are layered in a work um, can be very powerful and I think this is this is um, this is what um, black artists have been done mostly to disobey the classic formats and this can be very powerful for a younger generation because they can identify themselves with and they can um, learn a new language uh, i think uh, i think this is extremely important um i we're running out of time but i have mm -hmm. uh, another question here for you from peter in the artwork we see there are only three colors used by the actors attires for the actors attires black white and red do you want to attribute any kind of symbology to them or some sort of connection to the colors related to Arishas and their inner nature somehow? Um, yes, somehow, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, I think the first work on Arcesus, um was there is a, a small ceremony dedicated to Oshun. Mm -hmm. And Oshun is the goddess, the Orisha of the sweet waters of of of, of um, 
creativity and of of birth, the birth of something new. And uh, she is a goddess who, from the Yoruba mythology who has a mirror and looks at herself. And um, she brings the beauty, she brings the sweetness, she brings uh, the birth of, of new visions, of new things, of new objects, of new art. Um, she brings people together. So she was very much present in that uh, first, um, first um, uh, mythology, a myth. And the second myth at the Berlin Biennale, uh, the red uh, came. Um, the story of Oedipus is usually in psychoanalysis read and seen as a story of desire, the desire of the boy for the mother the boy who is in love with the mother and wants to kill the father. So it's a very um, sexualized um, story and um, a story of desire. And what I wanted to explore beyond this uh, relation of desire of Oedipus with the mother Jocasta, who he marries, was also to explore the politics to violence and the politics of genocide and how um, King Laius, the father of Oedipus, decides to kill his uh, son after birth because um, of a prophecy, because he sees his, his son as a, as a threat. And there comes uh, the goddess o Oya. The Oya is a, a warrior a warrior that, um, that is also related to the winds and who comes and, and cleans, cleans and uh, cleans the, the, the atmosphere and takes away the bad and brings the good and uh, opens and cleans our paths and helps us to fight the injustice. And um, that comes very strongly in Oedipus story. Also in the Sphinx, the Sphinx is one of the key elements of, of, uh, of Oedipus, uh, even though she appears only in one short episode, but she's also very symbolic because she's sent by the gods to the city because something very terrible and, um, and horrifying happened in the city. Um, and justice happened in the city and the gods sent her to sit on the top of the entrance and to ask a question to each person who wanted to get inside or outside. So um, she's asking each person and those who cannot answer a question are devoured and eaten by her and she, she eats them and kills them. And it's a very symbolic uh, symbolic uh, uh, character that actually is uh, telling us that we have to know our history and we cannot escape our history. The gods will send the Sphinx and the Sphinx will sit there and ask, what, what do you know? And uh, when we do not know our history, uh, she will eat us up symbolically. So to say, we cannot escape uh, our own history. So she brings these questions that are also questions that uh, or the Orisha, Oya, Oyansan also brings the wind, the warrior, um, or takes away what is not necessary, and so on. So I've 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 worked with colors and um, and with the symbolism. So when you enter the installation in, at the Berlin Biennale. Uh, I always have misangas, misangas from the beads from the different Odishas, and they are there uh, in all the works. They are present in the installations as well. Yes. So last question, I promise. And on a very different note uh, from Christopher, how do you feel about the medium of video in the immediate context of the Zoom phenomenon in the pandemic? The timing of seeing your work is striking to me. It's as if you're, you are prefiguring another cycle of foundational and foundational myths. Hmm. 
<laughs> That's think, beautiful. Uh, yes. <laughs> less of a question and more of a statement, which is mm. very interesting. I think it's asking about uh, what do you feel about um, video in the in, in the age of Zoom uh, curating and exhi exhibiting. I find it very tiring, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They have all these conversations. I keep, you know, I'm very bad with that because I always <laughs> um, reject everything. I always say, no, I don't want. Um, I just do some and then with people that I'm very strongly connected with. And still, I think it's too much. Um, uh, <laughs> <Okay>. I, think, <laughs> uh, I think, you know, I think it's, it's an important question because we came into these, um, I think this capitalist surveillance where we are yeah, always we're visible, where we are always visible and now in very intimate spaces even in our own houses and studios. So people can see where we work, where we yeah, live. Yeah. They can hear the children. Studio. I'm here talking with you and hearing my children there, <laughs> praying that they don't come inside <laughs> here <laughs> because it's very late. So um, I think I'm very afraid of something, you know, I'm very afraid that we know this, but I'm very afraid that our children do not know what privacy is. Yeah, yeah, um, you're certainly right. And this is something that is a basic element of human rights, that mm -hmm. there are some things that are private and there are some things that belong to you and not to everybody, not to the state. And we're coming to this acceleration of video and visuality of public video where we have always to be present. We don't have to travel anymore to a place to yeah. be present, which uh, in terms of the environment is wonderful. But I think we also have to learn to work and still to learn not always to be available and not always to be visible. And this is really a question I, I have been asking myself, um, how will be for the future generation? They, uh, they, learn, they don't know what privacy is. They think mm -hmm. that everything they eat and everything they do has to be photographed and shared universally. And um, so about these Zooms, um, it is wonderful to be in conversation, but I think we also have to learn to moderate how much we and how often we are, because it's so easy to be online all the it's time. It's addictive also. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a constant thing. And I think it's, it's quite interesting and important to think of this capitalist surveillance of this being constantly available, being constantly visible, um, sharing you and yourself and your privacy with everybody. I think it's a lesson also that we have to learn. But going to a video installation is great. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> magical. Um, and no, I, think we, we could... I, I think sometimes I think sometimes it's wonderful to have our conversation but it's even more beautiful uh, to go to a gallery or to a museum and to sit uh, for one hour listening to a story and then coming back the week after with a friend and another friend. And it has something very intimate. And if I may conclude our, this, uh, this question, with, you know, one of the things I wanted very much to create in this uh, trilogy of illusions, as well as in all other works um, of video installation, is to create a, a sense of intimacy where people enter and have a very intimate and very close relationship with the actors and with the storyteller. And they sit there. It was a big risk because I know that a video installation usually is not longer than six minutes. Yeah. And these films have 55 minutes or, or so. Mm -hmm. 
but I wanted to tell the story from the beginning to the end and, and, um, and to invite the audience to listen um, while we speak instead of silencing. And I think this tri triangle of speaking, silencing or listening is a very important exercise in the museums and galleries where people enter and see it and, and, and become part of the performance and they identify with the actors and they identify with the characters. And for many people, sometimes it was the first time that they were in front of seven black actors telling a story and performing. And this is quite powerful to do. And they stay for one hour to listen to a story that they identify with because it is a human tragedy. And, and still questions of whom then is considered a human and who represents the human condition in our society is part of the work. People have to question, is the white cube indeed neutral? And who can enter the white cube? And who is indeed represented in this politics? So there's maybe exactly this politics of the invisible, of, of simply being there and embracing the audience to come into these political questions um, and to leave the, the installation maybe with new questions that were not there before. Mm. Well, thank you, Grada, so much for this thank moment. You. I was I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, it is I, addictive to 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 have this kind of. There's not a lot of people here. It's 18 participants, which makes this like almost like a conversation, uh, a very privileged conversation. I want to also uh, acknowledge Angela Ferreira. She's been here since the beginning uh -huh. and she's a part of this show. Hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I want to finish by, by translating, so bear with me, <laughs> a phrase of, of your book, which I think uh, could be a nice way to, to close this session. And, and it also relates directly to the exhibition. So, in your, in your words, badly translated from Portuguese, it's something like colonial past is memorized, is remembered in, in the measure that it's not forgotten. Sometimes you rather not remember, but memory theory is in fact a theory of forgetting. You cannot simply forget and you cannot avoid remember. So thank you, Grada for your Obrigada. presence here and your spirit and i think again idoya thank um, you so much yes it's been so nice <laughs> um so short always but uh, i agree with you zoom is really exhausting <laughs> <laughs> so we I, I can we can only hope that maybe in the future one day you make it to madrid and we will have the chance for a coffee or something together Mm, that, that was good. the initial idea. <laughs> yeah, that was the initial idea, but the <laughs> pandemic um, did not allow. So thank you so much. Thank you, Bruno. And thank you to all of those who join. And hope to see you again soon, somewhere, hopefully not in a screen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so I much. Just, I have a lot of messages here from the audience saying that they love, they love the work, they love the conversation. So just to get that across. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nerea. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Grada, again. Obrigada. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Ciao. you.